are able to um, have these options of go slower and go faster. So if anyone would like for us to speed up the conversation, maybe um, as I tend to like to talk from time to time, maybe sometimes we'll get uh, a little bit bogged down on a sidetrack. If someone would like us to speed up, there's that option. Or if we're going a little bit too fast and it's a bit of a deep conversation, maybe they would like the opportunity for to request that we go slower. Those options are there as well. And if you select those, we're able to see it. And as an instructor, we're able to adjust our, um, and ju adjust our conversation, and adjust our lecture as we go. Okay, so that's our basic participant screen. Now the other big one is our Zoom chat feature, which you also see along this bottom baseline bar. You're able to select this and it will bring up this screen. Now in this case, um, this is obviously allowing you to uh, participate in conversation, maybe not necessarily by speaking or by video, but in just a common text chat uh, amongst our group. Now, not only does this allow for us to talk to everyone at the same time, but if you look at it, if you pull up your uh, Zoom chat in the bottom, uh, or along the bottom of your screen, you see it says to everyone. Now you can also select that to someone specific. So if you don't want to uh, specifically ask the instructor, you can ask one other um, individual that's in the session if you would like. As part of my classes, a lot of my students will uh, ask me questions directly on a private chat instead of directly to the class. Um, I think it gives them a little bit of the feeling of anonymity so that they don't have to ask everyone, they can ask me and kind of remain, uh, remain uh, anonymous kind of as we move forward, um, giving them a little bit more freedom to ask questions and not be concerned about other people judging them. Now, quite obviously, I've never really had much of an issue with people judging uh, other students, but I know that that is, or can be at least, a concern uh, for students. Also in this box, and this is kind of key, it allows you to share files amongst the people that are in the Zoom session, okay? So in this bottom section, you see file, and you're allowed to share whatever file you would like to. So I will share with you, you should be able to see now, um, this is a sample of our Biology 102 summer um, syllabus. So if anyone's interested in what the 102 syllabus looked like for the summer, I would be able to share that with you directly or to share this with the entirety of our group so that those files can be transferred directly within um, our group conversation, making things a little bit easier, um, you know, than sending people to specific areas to be able to download things. Okay, so overall, um, our, you know, that's, a, that's our chat session. And that's actually where a lot of our conversations occur is in these chat sessions. Um, you know, we do, talk back and forth, but one of the problems, as if, if, if you participated in Zoom uh, very often, a lot of people talk over one another. Zoom allows us to not have that issue, or the uh, chat feature allows us to not have as many issues with that. Um, and if you have a big class, you can mute everyone, allow questions to come into the chat box, and then you can unmute people uh, individually so that they can, everyone can talk and we can do so in a very um, specific, organized fashion that makes things a little bit easier. Now, one of the other um, components of this Zoom platform that's very beneficial um, when we're, we're teaching classes as well is the share screen function. Now, as an instructor, I do it all the time. But what it provides for you or for the student is that um, it gives us the opportunity for things like presentations, uh, for instance, in my summer course, uh, part of the 101 section is to present uh, a lab report or a presentation on specific aspects of the class. And what I can do for that is essentially turn over control of the entire session to one student, which then gives them the option to share their desktop. So you can look at specifically uh, what their PowerPoints may be, um, gives them access to a whiteboard, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but that's a big option too that students can kind of draw and work out math problems. Uh, web browsers um, also access specifically to things like your iPhone, your iPad, 
uh, that allows you to see certain files and share that with everyone in the course. It works really great uh, in giving us the opportunity to still do presentations, to still interact um, with one another and share knowledge with one another, um, just as we would in the classroom, but in this online setting. So with that, I'm actually going to, as I'm sharing with you now, uh, let you guys take a look here at my presentation, okay? So this is actually one of our, um, one of our uh, lectures from this past summer and the, the spring as well, um, in which we were talking specifically about selection, natural selection versus, um, versus uh, artificial selection. So one of the big questions that I asked as part of this course or as part of this lecture or this uh, uh, lesson was we looked at um, how things change over time. And the question that I ask is we know that all domesticated dogs, regardless of what you're talking about, your lab or your poodle, um, whatever dog that may be sitting next to you while you're watching this, at some point arose from wild wolves. Okay. So the question for you and the question for the students in this case is how as a culture, as a, a group of individuals, did we take wild wolves that look like this and hunt in packs and are very vicious and make this guy? Or Chihuahua, which is tiny and wears a pink, pink dress and looks very, very cute and is very subdued, okay? So there's a few ways that you can actually address this. And one of the best ways that I have found is by allowing for students to participate in their own little groups. So much like we would do group work in the classroom, we can also allow for group work within the Zoom session. These are specifically called breakout rooms, and I'm going to give you one in just a moment, but it's going to be very brief. And you can set this up in a few, various different ways. And, and for this session, it doesn't really matter too much, but what it does is it groups everyone into their own group of four or five people so that they can have their own discussion. The same way you would form groups of four or five people in the classroom to allow them to chat about whatever the topic may be and come up with their answer, we can do the same here, okay? So I'm gonna give you a brief one, all right? Form your ideas. We're not gonna really come back and talk about this, but I just want you to see how this works, okay? So what I'm gonna do is assign everyone a breakout room, give you 20 or so seconds, and then I'll bring everyone back and you'll see kind of how this works, okay? So here's your breakout rooms, all right? Okay, and boom. Oops. It does in this case give you a bit of a countdown. So we have a few people that will be joining us as we move forward. Um, but um, it tells you, okay, our, our breakout room has ended. It is time to come back and we can all come back and speak, um, speak kind of as a group, okay? And you all saw that. As you see, the, the breakout room gives you the warning. You've got one minute to close it down. You've got 30 seconds to close it down and we can all come back and then have our answers as a whole. So whatever questions people may have, whatever ideas that they have come up with, um, we can all discuss those kind of moving forward, okay? So another option is, this is another thing that we, um, we're able to use as part of our discussions, as part of our uh, lessons on each of these topics, is we can also embed video. So me with a, a background specific in education technology and using technology in the classroom, I really enjoy um, allowing for viewing different videos. This is also, this is not something that we have to send you to YouTube. This is not something that we have to say, okay, go watch this video. We'll take a break and everybody come back. We can all watch it as a group. Um, so we're able to embed this into our lectures, uh, watch it as it moves forward. And it's funny to me, and I'm not gonna make you watch the entirety of this video, but I say I have a background in education technology, but one of the videos that I like to show probably more than anything is this one from the 1950s, 
uh, when the technology wasn't the greatest. And this actually looks at, um, as a brief description of what this is talking about, as we uh, talk in our class about natural selection and your environment picking certain behaviors as being beneficial for you to survive. Well, in this case, is, this is the discussion of the, quote unquote, the behavior of lemmings. And the behavior that they're participating in, and at least this video, is they're all running to the edge of this cliff and jumping off into the ocean. And I make the students, or ask the students to watch this video, and then we come back together to discuss, well, why would nature ever pick this? Why would nature ever say, your entire population go jump off of that cliff and fall into the ocean and die? And we get a lot of cool answers from this, um, and students, you know, come up with some great ideas, but this is also kind of the concept that I bring back is that this actually is not a true real video. This is not a real thing that is happening. This is a, uh, a documentary that was produced by Walt Disney back in the 1950s, won uh, one of the awards for movie broadcasting. I'm not counting my awards, I apologize. But in this case, it wasn't nature that was saying, hey, lemmings, go jump off of this cliff. It was a group of cameramen that were behind them chasing them and they saw it to the, their best option was, hey, we got to get out of here. So let's jump off of this cliff. So this is also talking about how nature would select a behavior versus how human influence can influence that behavior and how things can change. And this, again, allows for discussion. It allows us to see things such as this and uh, incorporate it into our Zoom to participate. So um, one of the big myths of science, lemmings jumping off the cliff, not a real thing unless you have a cameraman chasing them and then they definitely will. So another one of our options, and this actually goes along with our share screen option, is um, it provides us the opportunity to use what they call the whiteboard. So the whiteboard allows for, as you'll see in a moment, I'll give you this example. So this is one of the big uh, concepts that we discuss in population genetics looking at um, an equation called Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And I won't go through the details on this. It's not time for a math lesson, and I fully am okay with that. Uh, but what I wanted you to see here is we're able to give students questions such as this. So we walk through the equation, how you work it out, and then we give them, you know, work this out on your paper, and we'll come back, all right? Recessive allele B, in this case, occurs with a frequency of 0.8 in a population of crabs. Uh, that is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and students at this point would know what that is. So the question becomes, what is the frequency of the dominant allele? This is very simple, okay? But here's how we would work it out on the whiteboard, all right? All you really need to know in this case, let me bring this up. All you would really need to know in this case is that P plus Q oops, that's equals, plus Q equals one. We know that in our equation, we were given Q equals 0.8% or 0 0.8 in this case, and we wanna solve for P. So we can walk through the entirety of this math question, right, on the whiteboard, the same way that we would do it on the board in the classroom. Now, this is a very simple equation we could solve, you know, P uh, plus 0.8 equals 1. So we can solve for that and know that P equals 0 0.2, okay? That's our equation. But this also gives you um, the opportunity to do various other things, okay? It gives you, um, like, one of the big things we do are Punnett squares, so it allows you to draw, okay? So in this case, uh, we're drawing our Punnett square. If you remember these from when you did them at whatever point in your career. Okay, so we'll draw our Punnett squares and then we can put in our, our alleles on the top and the side and figure out frequencies. It allows you to freehand draw. Um, this is great for people who are great at animating um, and, and drawing in a digital format. I am not fantastic at that, but uh, some, of, some people are. And it gives you like little, you know, you can set in, like for instance, sometimes I use these for alleles just as markers. So you can put different stamps on this as well. The point here is that it gives you the same opportunity or at least a version of the same opportunity that we have in the classroom 
with our whiteboards. And it's very, the same way that I have access to this, I could turn over access to any student that wants to do the same. And I could draw everything up for them, for instance, on our Punnett Square in this case and say, go at it. And then they can fill it in, okay? Very handy, um, great uh, resource as part of this as well, okay? So let's go back to this. Okay, so whiteboard, very handy in what we're doing. I um, mean, there's a variety of other opportunities and options as well. So this is one that you can kind of, uh, to use a little bit of education jargon, you can use this for uh, formative assessments. So kind of looking at, stu are students gathering uh, what I'm trying to put, are they picking up what I'm trying to put out there? So are they gathering the piece of information that I'm trying to teach them? So this would be one example. I'm not gonna grill you on the details quite obviously, but this is talking about uh, the process of replication in DNA. And we talk about the specific enzymes that are involved in it. So in this case, we introduced DNA helicase. And helicase is responsible for unzipping, unzipping or opening our DNA up for this process. So we can go through this. And then at the end of it, I can give a little poll, okay? So everyone at this point should be able to see, here's your question. Which enzyme is responsible for opening or quote unquote unzipping the DNA double helix during the process of, of DNA replication? And you should be able to select one of these, okay? So feel free, if you see this, select your own option. Okay, go for it, give me some answers. Okay. Now this is an anonymous situation. So this is not gonna say that any individual specifically answered any option, but it gives the instructor an overall perspective as to who gets it and who doesn't, or is the majority of the class understanding what I'm saying, or do I need to go back and talk about it? So it gives me a little bit more, um, you know, of a feel of where are students in the learning process. And you can do this for a variety of things. The, the polling option is 100% open to, you know, whatever uh, opportunities you want to make it, okay? And the big thing at the end is you can actually share with the students, well, here's what everybody thought, all right? And these are also opportunities that you can take this, okay, you should be at this point able to see the poll results. We could take this and, you know, put students into breakout groups again to talk about, well, why'd you select, what did you select and why? Well, why do you think it's polymerase and why do you think it's helicase? So what's the difference? And then students can solve these uh, misconceptions and then we can come back together and say, all right, well, what'd we come up with? And from there we can, you know, use that as part of the learning process. Very um, handy. Uh, the key that I think is important to this is that it's anonymous. It's something that students can say something without getting their names associated with it so that they're not worried about what those outcomes may be. Okay. Um, in this case, I have one question. I don't see a poll. Um, the poll should have showed up. It looks like it showed up for most of you. The web version may have a little bit of a different opportunity. This is, these are a little bit of the kinks that you'll see in Zoom where you're accessing from and what computer system or operating system you may be using. There's a little bit of different variation, but that's also something uh, the instructors are very well versed in and something that we can actually address uh, on an individual basis at the very, very beginning of the class so that everybody's on the same page and everyone has the same opportunities. Okay. So another big thing, and I'm, I'm running a little bit out of time. Again, I like to talk and I apologize for that. But um, as part of our online courses in science, uh, we administer um, our quizzes and our exams via the D2L uh, uh, homepage that we have for each of our courses. They show up, as you see in this offer, this is one screenshot from my summer course, all right? And it shows you both the quizzes or exams that are going to occur in the future along with their availability dates, as, as well as your previous exams that you took throughout the semester and when they were open, when they closed, and it will see, show you if you attempted it. So in this case, if I had taken lecture exam one, it would say one of one, and it tells me my grade. 
So not only do you have access to your grades immediately, but you can go to, or in your grade book, but you can go to this assessment list, see the specific assignment, see that you took it and see what your grade was uh, in that option. Now, one of the great things about this, these online opportunities for these quizzes and these exams is we as instructors have a lot of um, adjustability for these, okay? We can time them so I can give you, you know, two hours to complete it, I can give you 30 minutes to complete it, and you can very much base that on how many questions they are, uh, what type of questions they are, and what, what type of, um, you know, necessary uh, opportunities students need to complete them. This is also on an individual basis, so if students have um, individual um, learning plans that they need extra time on assignments, I can give one student, one student a little bit of an additional time period to complete it over another. So we can adjust according to that. We also have the ability on our end to use what's called the lockdown browser, which essentially prevents students from taking these, these assessments and Googling the answers. It locks down your browser. So that if you lose or if you leave that assessment, it shows me. Okay, so that's a big plus in preventing things like cheating, um, you can also uh, control number of attempts. In some cases, specifically on quizzes, the, the, the goal is not to take it one time and do great. It's take it until you figure it out. So you can give students unlimited opportunities. You can give students five opportunities to see what they've missed, go back and look at it in the textbook and correct for that. Um, all of those options are available and uh, these online assessments are very, um, very well put together and, and uh, very beneficial in the learning process. Now, one big question um, that individuals have about online instruction, specifically in the sciences, is how do you do labs? Okay, so we have one big, um, you know, access to an awesome uh, program that enables us to do labs in a virtual setting. So we don't have to come to the lab. We don't have to worry about social distancing. We can do this in an online format at our homes without having any of those other concerns. And where you access this is through the purchase of your textbook. So purchasing the textbook for biology, specifically for Biology 101, gives you access to a program called McGraw-Hill Connect. And not only does this give you an opportunity to do your virtual labs, but it also gives you access to the homework, okay? And I'll show you what this looks like, all right? So this is the student view of what Connect looks like, okay? Now in this case, this is my summer course that is set up and Again, if you purchase the textbook, it gives you what is called the connect code, and this is actually linked to D2L. So I can set it up, and as students complete these assignments, I see who has done what and how far they have progressed through this. So I have it set up, and this is just specific to my class, and other instructors, instructors may have it differently. But as far as homeworks go, okay, I have my course set up by units. So we could look at, in this case, unit two. And we could look first at, for every unit, my students have a homework assignment, okay? In this case, unit two homework. If they wanted to access that, we go over here and we click it. Click begin. Takes a little bit of time. All right, and in this case, this is something that I provide my students uh, unlimited opportunities. So if they miss something, they can go back and take it and fill this out as much as possible. But each question has a variety of different opportunities. So this is a select all of the above, or all, of, all that apply. This is a labeling picture. You can drag and drop, move forward for each of these, okay? Um, but this is an example of the homework, all right? And when you're done, submit it, okay? Uh, let's progress out of that, okay? You also have access to uh, an electronic um, textbook. So this would be specific to, one moment, it takes a little bit to load. All right, this is the electronic textbook or what they call the smart book, um, specifically in this case for cell structure. And it walks you through, this is the same information that you see in the textbook, but it walks you through and it's an interactive 
uh, an interactive experience. Okay, so we can walk through and read each of these. Um, in this in this case is, whoops. <laughs> But you can read the entirety of the textbook. There's embedded uh, videos. There's embedded um, different opportunities for students to see different things. This is something that I make optional for my students, but the students that use it um, have said that they have been uh, very pleased with the way that it works. Okay. And after reading a specific section, so if a student went in, uh, did their reading on, uh, um, in this case, section 4.1, you could go in and there's practice questions. So if I want to practice to see if I actually got it, you can do this as well. Okay. So another opportunity. Again, these are um, online. Whoops. Having a little bit of a um, issue of it going in circles for me, but that's okay. So you can do those for each unit. Again, those are opportunities for the students and outside learning. If you don't necessarily um, catch on to what we're talking about in class, this is an option for that. Also the virtual labs, this is probably the most important part. Uh, weeks, um, each week has their own series of virtual labs. We'll go to um, week three in this case. And students would know during week three, you have to complete these two virtual labs. So you click on them again. Okay, and it gives you, it gives you, um, you know, the opportunity. Here's a little uh, picture or, or video that how to work specifically the microscope. Um, oops, got to watch the entirety of the video in this case. Sorry, which is kind of a good thing. It makes you watch the entirety of it to be able to progress. Okay. All right, this is showing you how to adjust, fine tune. I gotta turn it on, I'm getting ahead of myself, I apologize. But we would turn on our microscope by clicking the little button, focus with the light, how the different lenses work, and you just click different buttons to walk through specifically kind of the same things that you would see in class. And you do these for each of these virtual labs. So for each topic, you kind of have your own different um, opportunities or on different, um, you're able to see the same stuff and interact with it, but instead of holding it by hand, it's a point and click situation. The good thing about this is that it's a direct correction. So if the student, as you saw, doesn't do things in the right order, or for instance, immediately goes to fine adjustment instead of course adjustment on our microscope, it alerts you of that. And it says, no, you can't do this, and here's why. And those are good opportunities as well. And with more time, I would have walked you through the entirety of that. So I apologize, but it's a great uh, learning tool for students as well. Okay. So that's going to take me to questions and I've already got one. Um, so what other learning resources outside of the class are available to students? So uh, MTC um, has always had um, our academic success center uh, to where we have uh, tutoring opportunities. Now in the past, we've been very heavy on the on-campus, uh, everyone come get tutoring on whatever topic that you may, uh, may have. And we had face-to-face uh, -face sessions with tutors that were able to help up with any other topics that you may have. Well, since everything has gone online, uh, the Academic Success Center has actually uh, been able to contract with tutor.com online tutoring as well. And these tutoring sessions can be just as we are communication, uh, communicating via Zoom. They can be uh, quote unquote face to face via video and students and tutors can interact one on one on whatever topics that they may have. Uh, they have specialists in not only biology, but any other uh, subject that you may have. Um, and also the, the great thing about it is you're able to really schedule it whenever you want to. While the on-campus uh, option is awesome, uh, these uh, tutor, online tutoring sessions can really be flexible in time, even like late nights or early mornings. There are tutors that are, are open uh, to meet the needs of our online students as well. Those can be scheduled through our Academic Success Center, which students have access to through D2L and MyMTC so that they're able to uh, set those sessions up. 
Are there any additional questions? Anything else? Anything's fair game here, guys. All good. Um, I will say that the coming into this, I believe a lot of instructors were very um, skittish about how you make the transition from in class to online. And I will also very much say that as a whole, Midlands Tech has embraced online learning and allowing for social distancing and providing for students who don't feel comfortable for whatever reason to come to campus. And I have seen nothing but overwhelming success. Um, you know, coming from a science background, it is a big concern. And if you speak to anyone in the science community, the biggest thing is like, how in the world do you work out labs? How do you do it and make it make it equivalent? We have been great. The the department chairs, the the deans, the um, course coordinators have been awesome at setting these opportunities up. Um, I feel completely confident moving forward in all that I am doing and all of the instructors that I speak with on a daily basis feel the same way. Um, we are happy to welcome students back on campus, but this is an opportunity for those who feel more comfortable online learning as well. Any questions? I'm going to pop into the chat my personal email. As I'm sure there are many people that you can reach out to um, about these and many different departments that you can reach out to about any concerns or questions that you may have, please reach out to them. But I want you to know on a personal perspective, I'm here as well if there's anything for anyone else. With that, um, the question here is, do we have a choice to do online and in-person? We have those opportunities. It is, it is my understanding, and I don't want to speak out of turn, uh, but for the courses that I teach specifically, there are online options and there are in-person options. Um, I would check with advisement. I would check with uh, the, course, uh, the course listings for the upcoming semester in the fall. Those are um, listed for you, and advisement can definitely put you where you want to be. Uh, but those opportunities are there. For instance, in the fall, I am teaching both on campus, face-to-face, -face, and online uh, virtually via Zoom. My, class, my lessons will essentially be the same, at least on the same content, and just be in a different format. So, any other questions? All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining me and taking your time on a Wednesday evening uh, over supper to be able to join me in this discussion and again I'm here if anyone has questions best of luck in the fall hopefully I'll see some of you there and we'll move forward from there take care team